Hello? 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 This is the Vancouver Commercial with a state podcast. And welcome back to Vancouver Real Estate Podcast. Adam. Adam. Yeah, Corey. Yeah. This is the Vancouver Commercial Real Estate Podcast. This is our first show. Right. You can't welcome anyone back. Right. right. Let, let me help a, you out I here. And, sec- and secondly, it's not your show. I have control issues. <laughs> but let, is, let me help you out. Let me help you this out. This is exciting. Yeah, take it from here, Corey. Welcome to our first Vancouver Commercial Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Corey Wright. This is our inaugural episode on today. We have two very, very special guests. We were spitballing the idea of what is our first topic? How are we going to introduce the show to the marketplace? We tried with a couple of commercial professionals that we just couldn't get it lower level enough. So we thought we'd bring on two realtors that had no idea how commercial works. I'd like to welcome my special guest today, Adam and Matt Scalina. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks thanks for overselling us. I really <laughs> appreciate that. <laughs> this may be the first time where the guests are actually asking the questions and you're bringing us on because we literally know nothing about the subject. Well, yeah. I think the, the, we want to unpack the whole commercial world for everybody. Right. So I think obviously getting genuine type commercial type questions that we can answer to try to introduce this podcast to everyone before we take it from there is probably the best way. And also you guys told me before we went on that your whole retirement's tied up in this show and then that uh, you want to make sure before you let me go and take the training wheels off, I don't crash the bike, so. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, Corey, this is definitely your two-wheeler and uh, we're, we're just happy to be uh, on, on the front handlebars and the back pegs. So uh, we appreciate that. But uh, here's, what, here's what I'd like to do is, is just start because you're right. Matt, Matt and I follow the commercial real estate uh, market a little bit. Uh, we generally know a bit about it, but we're we're not experts, which is why we uh, why we we want to talk to you today. Um, can we maybe start just by having like a general market overview on what's going on in commercial real estate in Vancouver? For sure. Well, I think I think we're experiencing probably similar to what you guys have experienced going into this pandemic over the past year. There's a lot of uncertainty and questions out there, and then about three or four months in, we started to get a better idea of what was happening in our marketplace, and we're happy to say that fortunately the marketplace has not imploded on itself. Like there was a lot of worrisome out there. And I think Vancouver, more so than most markets around the world, was in a position that we could take a bit of a blow if we had to because we had vacancy rates in some asset classes that were the lowest in North America and probably almost unhealthy, to be honest with you. Why why is that? Well, I think if you look at like Vancouver and one of our largest drivers, say, in the office market is, is the tech industry. And going into the pandemic, I mean, they were one of our largest type tenants, them in kind of the co-working spaces out there. Coming out of the pandemic, a lot of the largest leases that were signed in the city here and probably around the world for that matter were for the tech industry. And I think we, us not being a head office city, we didn't have a lot of square footage to deal with when the tech industry started coming in four, five, six years ago. There's been a scramble to try to keep up with that. And there's estimates as much as 4.6 million square feet that are coming into the marketplace and are either under construction and will be delivered over the next sort of three to four years. And a lot of the absorption rate of that has been very, very healthy. So I think when you look at the livability of the city, the proximity to some of the major, major tech industries down south, it almost creates a perfect storm, I think, for uh, landlords in that situation and it made it a very unhealthy market for sort of non-tech tenants to try to get into that marketplace. So this is interesting, Corey, because a lot of people, at least I remember about a year ago, were really terrified for Vancouver because it's often thought of, you know, a place where nobody actually does anything uh, except, you know, uh, eat on patios, uh, a lot of tourism. It seemed like it was potentially, and I'm talking about COVID here, a perfect storm for the commercial uh, real estate market. But, But it seems like we've weathered it well. Well, don't kid yourself. Some asset classes have been affected more than others. Like I don't think without question, restaurants and hotels have greatly been affected, especially in the city of Vancouver. But I think one thing too, that if you look internationally right now, if you look at like down south, and I'm not saying that they were the best ones to deal with the pandemic, but if you look at a lot of the large vacation areas, people are slowly coming back. And it's only a matter of time. People are itching to get back there. 
I think we're going to have a very strong 2022 and a, probably a very strong 2023 in commercial real estate, but also the tourism industry here because people are itching to get back, which a year ago people questioned if that was ever going to come back to reality. Yeah. If, Everyone's the new norm- fly the, again. The new, yeah, right. The new normal. It, we're never going back to the normal. Yeah. I feel like that was uh, wildly exaggerated. Well, I think if you yeah. look at polls too, that maybe conducted maybe a year ago with employers that maybe don't want office space anymore and employees that don't want to come to the office. I'm pretty sure if you repoll those people on a monthly basis, the percentages of people that want to come back to the office probably increased month over month. And I think it. I mean, it was it was a cool thing for a while. And I think some companies can probably still operate within that system or sort of a hybrid system. But from an employer standpoint, you I mean, could you imagine going to your office Christmas party and meeting your coworkers for the first time? There'd be, there'd be no environment. There'd be no culture. There'd be no work environment. There'd be no retention of employees. So I think if we go back to things that happened maybe back, say, in 9-11, when the terrorism things hit New York, people said no one's going to live in a high rise ever again. No one's going to go in an office tower ever again. And a lot of times things get said in these unforeseen situations. Then we look back a couple of years or three or four years down the road and we're creatures of habit. We're going to go right back to what we know is best. And I'm not saying the faces of these tenants won't change in different asset classes, but I think, I think it'll go back to the way it was before with sort of some new modifications and how it's done. That's all. Right, right. So, Corey, a large impetus for this show, I think, is that, you know, we've had a lot of fun with the Vancouver Real Estate Podcast, and you've been a guest many times, and that's the world of residential real estate. And I think residential is actually quite complicated and interesting, and it goes to show because we've been doing a show for six years, week in, week out, and and I feel like at least I'm still interested, which is is a positive. But commercial is a lot, uh, I feel like uh, for a lot of people, is a world that they just don't have a clue wh- what it is, how it works. And that's why when we were, you know, uh, spitballing this idea, it, it made so much sense. So maybe can we just talk about COVID and commercial real estate, but specifically how has COVID impacted the different asset classes in commercial real estate? Or to put it another way, what is commercial real estate and how has last year impacted Yeah, and I the think market? that's one thing too that, that you mean, it, commercial real estate is so much more accessible to so many people that they just don't really understand it or they don't think it's accessible to them. And we're going to break that down week after week with bringing on different guests that's going to talk about different opportunities and how sort of these deals are funded and all that stuff. But breaking down to the commercial real estate, there's really six asset classes that we work within. We have our retail, we have our office space, industrial, multifamily, development land, and hotels. And then you have sort of a subsector of the industrial market, which has gained a lot of a lot of traction over the past few years, which is self-storage. And right. that's, that's a whole episode on itself that we can unpack of how, how much that asset class has just exploded over the past five years. Okay, so let's dig into to each of these asset classes. So retail, what is it? I think most people will have an idea. Yep. What is it? And how has it been impacted this last year? Well, I think besides the hotel industry, retail without a doubt, especially in say like Vancouver, where you have such huge tourism every single year, has been much more affected than most of the other asset classes, even more so than office for that matter. Retail is comprised of, of anything from sort of a restaurant all the way up to your mom and dad tie-dye t-shirt shop and everything in between. And I think one thing that COVID will have a big effect on is there is going to be vacancy and there's going to be challenging in certain areas. But I think it's going to accelerate the change of retail. And by that, I mean... If you go back 10 years ago to a dentist office, there's a high probability you probably went up an elevator into an office building. Well, over that same time period, a lot of medical and service-based tenants have been coming out of the office sector and more into the retail sector. I think COVID is going to accelerate that that much more where landlords are going to have to be much more specific and conscious of the type of tenants they're putting in. And I don't want to say, are these tenants pandemic-proof? But I mean, will they have a high probability of making it through a worldly event like this in the future where maybe the mom and dad tie-dye shop, unfortunately, maybe doesn't get through it? Mm -hmm. So I think they're definitely going to see a changing of the guard a lot in a lot of the retail things. And unfortunately, especially in a city like Vancouver, probably even Victoria for that matter, probably soon to be Kelowna, where lease rates are increasing, is going to push out more and more of the mom and pop shops. And you're going to have to become much more supported by medical service-based and maybe more international type retailers than you do with the local guys. Huh. Interesting. One thing we've been thinking about since about March 2020 is, and again, it seems like it's been over-exaggerated in some respects, 
the kind of carnage, the fallout. Yeah. Do you foresee? Are we are we through that? potential kind of carnage in the streets when it comes to commercial real estate? Or are there government supports that when those disappear, the world's going to get trickier? And like, what does that look like? Are there going to be deals? Are there going to be foreclosures? Like, how does this all play out? Well, we, we suffer from lack of inventory on a good day. And not that there's been a lot more inventory really come available. I think like everyone expected. And, and like I said, some asset, asset classes will be more affected than others. But, but specifically retail. Like specifically retail. retail. Seems yeah, anyone who's kind of still standing right now, I think has a very high probability of getting through this. And obviously with the latest shutdowns that we're dealing with more on the restaurant side of things to going in dining. In dining inside? Dining inside, dining inside. <laughs> um, you mean a lot of those things that have, are going to get through that now with the optimism in the marketplace, the patio season coming up, the expanded patios that are there. I think a lot of places have learned a lot about themselves, where if you look at, say, Kelowna, for example, where last year they closed down Bernard from, I think, the four or 500 block right up to uh, right up to the lake there down by Water Street, is they, they opened it up and they had street side, you know, street side patios spill right into the road. And it created right. such an amazing culture, so much so that I think they're looking at permanently closing well, down. Well, and this that. is, you know what, I hope they do the same in Vancouver because you see, you know, I walk along Commercial Drive every yeah. morning and uh, the... Eh, Honestly, there shouldn't be cars on commercial drive, but the patios yeah. that have spilled out into the street, I think are, man, it, it would make life a lot better if those remained. I, I think there's a lot of cities have learned a lot about themselves. And I think there's a lot of things that they're going to better moving forward. And one of those things I think that, especially here in, in the province of BC through liquor licensing, is I think there's hopefully going to be a little less tolerance to allow these patios to expand and become a little bit bigger and more of an attraction type of thing. And that will just help out the restaurant business period all summer long, because if you only have a small patio, and you're competing with a guy that's got double or triple the seats, this kind of makes it a little more competitive, higher survival rate of right. a lot of these restaurants coming out of it. So if I understand on the retail side, the deals, if you were going to get one, potentially is already, you've, that ship sailed. Well, I think you're going to find too, if we look at the back half of this, look at interest rates. They're a third of what they were arguably probably a year ago. And when you mean the carnage has not been as much as bad as everyone first thought. There hasn't been a large amount of supply really offered, like at first thought potentially it could be. And all of a sudden now you put in interest rates that are say sub 3% in the commercial world that might have been sitting in that five, five plus range. It makes it a lot cheaper to debt service this stuff. So that creates a very competitive landscape for buyers. And I think, you I mean, the lack of inventory that's come to the market has resulted in some very high prices being paid for property, sometimes in multiple offer situations due to the fact of really cheap money in the marketplace and lack of supply. And, and just so I understand, when you say lack of supply, because more so than residential, I feel like in residential, you can imagine COVID by hook or by crook, especially considering deferrals and mortgage payments and things like that, people need a need a roof over their head, right? Yeah. Whereas I, you could imagine, and I might be wrong about this, but that people in on, say, in retail are potentially giving up properties that are vacant, right? But it sounds like the inventory is still low. The inventory is still low across the board. And that's that's one thing, too, that, that I think if we went back a year ago, there was probably a lot of anticipation, a lot of people that were maybe purchasing retail or looking to buy retail, whether it can be from an investment or an end user standpoint, probably hit the brakes, wanted to see how things panned out. There wasn't an oversupply of inventory that came to the market for sale. There wasn't, you mean, the carnage in a lot of areas that I think were first thought. So that there kind of made it almost a perfect storm from a seller's perspective if you do want to sell, which created some very high prices along the way. Wow. T totally, totally opposite of, of what you'd expect, or at least what I would expect in that situation. Okay, so we've got retail. We understand what retail is. We got retail down. Seems like it's done all right in the last uh, 12 to 18 months, if I understand correctly. Let's move on to office because vacancy rates in Vancouver pre-pandemic were, in the words uh, of, uh, of a good commercial broker I know, almost unhealthy, if yeah. I understand. Yeah. Well, I think depending on what report you read pre-pandemic, there was arguments that we were probably at a sub 3% vacancy rate throughout the city. And there's about four and a half to 4.6 million square feet, depending on what report you read on what day coming to market very, very soon or under construction scheduled to be delivered in the next couple of years. The absorption rate for a lot of that inventory was very, very high pre-pandemic. Now, again, some of those places haven't taken occupancy yet. 
one linchpin, I think, potentially in that is the WeWorks of the world. And there's been some rumors about them not maybe moving forward with some commitments. So that could put a little bit more supply on the thing. But if you look at a balanced office market in a New York setting, seven, eight, nine percent is probably a balanced market. There's reports now that say we might have as high as six percent, some of that being on sublease. I think you're going to find some of those tenants that put their stuff for sublease in the middle of the pandemic, realize now that they do want to go back to the office space. So that number probably will fall, but we're still at incredibly low rates compared, vacancy rates compared to other cities throughout Canada and throughout North America. And one of our biggest saving graces here is the tech industry. If you look at them, they're expanding through the pandemic, taking more space. And if you look at the post building, which is now going to be fully occupied by Amazon throughout the offices, Apple's coming in. So the tech industry that got, that grew during the pandemic is one of our largest tenants, if not the largest office tenant we have throughout the city. And that will be a fallback thing that we will be able to sort of fall back on that will save our office market if that's if that's even a, a way we can even put it. Interesting. So there's been a lot of talk about people continuously working from home. One would presume if you're a tech employee, those are the, of anyone, yeah. those are the guys that can work from home, will uh, continue to work from home. It sounds like that's not the way you're seeing it. Not right now at this stage, that hasn't been. And I think, like I said, from an employer standpoint, you know, you want office culture, you want retention, you want to create that. That's very hard to do through video, regardless of what somebody says. And some of the biggest leases signed around the world during this time period was were Facebook and TikTok. Facebook signed for 740,000 square feet in New York. And they're a company that's supposed to work from home forever or something. Someone told me at one point. So when you look at that, like again, a lot of things get said during this, the turmoil and then it may not come to fruition. I think you're seeing now that the office market will be one that maybe people thought would be devastated, that I think when you look back 12 months down the road or 24 months down the road, it's going to go right back to the way it was. We have big demand coming into the city. We're an international city now. Our numbers are still dramatically low. If you look at like a San Francisco, even from a a AAA office standpoint, we still aren't aren't even close to the numbers that they're achieving down there for office space. And so that goes the same for New York and stuff. So they're still as high as they are. There's still room to grow. We might have had a blip on the radar, but I think... Looking back a couple of years, I think we'll just be status quo almost to where we were pre-pandemic, as bullish as that sounds. So, so, so Corey, why, why is, why are the vacancy rates so low in Vancouver? Like, so I, you're saying, you know, pre pre-pandemic, three percent for office. Yeah. Uh, post-pandemic, maybe six percent, but eight to ten is kind of the norm. What and presumably in Calgary it's forty, uh, but what? So that's a whole different. Story. That, that's an episode. <laughs> that's an episode. episode. That's, that's an episode, episode in itself. How, how is it that Vancouver, like it just you know on the, uh, I know the answer is on the residential side, but is it is it kind of the same on well, think, in the office? I think, I think when you look at like this, like the tech industry, we'll go back to that. You know, I mean the talent that we have here to draw from, the education platforms that we have here to draw from, proximity probably to Seattle and San Francisco probably also help with us. And I think the livability, like you don't realize it until you sort of travel elsewhere and you come back here to Vancouver and you realize that we have one of the most beautiful cities in the whole world. And we, we're, we're easily accessible by port, by plane, both internationally and all that stuff. So I think all of that stuff combined with us being landlocked. You mean like the same way you guys see on the residential tower side, everyone being landlocked, it's the same thing converts into commercial. There's only so much land available. And if we need more office space, if we need more industrial space, if we need more retail space, we have the same challenges that the residential world deals with if you're looking at the downtown Vancouver marketplace. And that's even though we're not a head office city. Well, I, it, we're not. And I think you're you're going to find that as these companies like Amazon come in and create net 2,000 or 2,500 more jobs, these people are going to want to live downtown. They're going to be young professionals that are probably high earners that have disposable income. Not only are they going to be in a position to probably pay the rents or buy the condos in the downtown city, but they're also going to have the money to go shopping at the downtown luxury stores and go out for drinks and cocktails on Friday. So that, I think, coming back into the marketplace, that will then create that surge that we'll be looking for in the coming months, if not years, to really drive that marketplace back to where it was pre-pandemic. Okay, so we've got fairly surprising news on the retail front. Yeah. Office, not too bad, actually. This seems like those vacancy rates don't seem outlandish to me at all. Um, one thing that I I think is is worth considering here is, you know, on retail, if somebody's thinking, listening to this and thinking, okay, I, I'm kind of curious 
to listen to this Vancouver Commercial Real Estate Podcast strictly to think about it, you know, uh, as a potential investment. Yeah. So the retail space is is one area, uh, especially with these uh, stratified commercial properties. That's yeah. that's an area that you know your mom and pop investor can get into, 100%. right? Uh, and and you're going to talk about that more. Correct me if I'm wrong, but office, that's basically, that's where the big boys and girls play. There's, yeah, well, there's, typically, there's not a lot of opportunities there for the moment. There's pops. not a lot of office strata available, and, and especially in the in Vancouver marketplace. Like, you know, there's more coming. And even when you look at the pricing of the strata offices, I mean, there's been some projects downtown that were launched sort of pre-pandemic that I don't think obviously got the steam they wanted to with the pandemic coming. But there was some stuff at north of $2,500 a foot for office space. So if you're a mom and pop investor, I mean, you probably scratch your head and think I'm spending $2.5 million to buy a thousand square foot office space. And um, you mean, stuff like that doesn't really exist as much. A lot of the stuff downtown obviously is owned by pension funds and institutional owners and stuff like that. And that's one thing where we'd be excited about with some future guests coming on is talking about how can you participate in syndicates like that or limited partnerships to buy into these buildings and that stuff. So... I mean, there's not a lot of opportunity in the Vancouver marketplace. There's not really a lot of strata office, to be honest with you, really anywhere when you look at it, what what versus isn't. But again, I think you'll see a lot more developers. We'll bring that out there for owner occupiers in the coming future. All right. We got retail. We got office. Let's talk industrial. And I'm not talking your Ford plants. Yeah, we're not talking these 10,000 square feet. What is places. going on in Vancouver? Because, you know, the the lands that used to be the industrial lands are, are often, it seems like it's just fewer and fewer and fewer areas in which you'd, you'd as a layman at least, driving around the city, say, hey, there's some, in, that's industrial. Yeah. Well, uh, well, how is industrial changing? How is how is COVID impacted it? And what's going on? Well, if we look at like pre-pandemic, it was terribly challenging to find good industrial. And part of the reason is when cities look to do bring out new OCPs or look at rezoning amendments, type of thing. Official community plans. Official right? community plans. Yep, for the OCP there. Uh, I mean, if you look at some of these industrial yards where they could be 10, 20, 30,000 square feet, and they might have a three or four thousand square foot building, and the rest could be yard space. So when cities are looking to potentially, where can we create future housing? You have these enormous lot sizes that for the most part can probably be better utilized. They come in with rezoning amendments that allow for greater density on these sites. So that's going to shrink your potential pool before you start. On the flip side of that, we're now seeing smaller and smaller industrial strata properties come available, but the zonings are becoming so much more flexible that you can have a much larger tenant base to draw from. So my, my inventory is dwindling. My tenant pool is growing and that's creating some of these perfect storms on the landlord side of things where we're seeing such huge increases in rents where you might go back into some areas where they were five or six dollars a foot, maybe not even 10 years ago. And those lease rates now are 20 or 25 dollars a foot, which on the surface might not sound like a lot. But when you look at it, that's four or five times what that lease rate was five years ago. Or 10 years ago. And, and so a lot of that, the dwindling inventory makes a lot of sense. I, I'm curious, can you give like an example of that that more flexible zoning? What, what does that actually look like? Like, can you spell yeah, so it out Yeah, so like us? there's some zonings, like even in Richmond, for example, in these small bay industrial, and small bay is probably typically 2,500 to 3,000 and below, where they, you can actually have professional services, like a law firm or an accounting firm actually come into these industrial places that maybe 10 years ago or 15 years ago, didn't exist. So with the growth of the tech industry and online businesses, they don't really need to pay for office or retail. So that naturally pivots them to industrial. You've got zonings are becoming so much more flexible that can allow for everything from medical services in some situations, all the way, like I said, to professional services, plus your typical industrial type tenants, dwindling supply, lease rates that are still incredibly cheaper versus retail and industrial yeah. creates that perfect surge from a landlord so, perspective. So I'm just thinking, and this is, uh, you know, a very basic example here, but if you're looking to sell T-shirts, yeah, right? I got a East Van T-shirt company. Yeah. Oh, now, now the truth comes out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it, obviously, you know, you're not going to open up a storefront on, on Robson, right? That, yeah. that the economics of that don't make sense, but there's a potential that if you're a successful t-shirt clothing company, you don't open up a storefront anywhere. Yeah. 
because the rents are a lot cheaper if you're in the industrial space than they would be on that retail space. And you're using an online platform almost entirely. I was just going to say, even with the growth of the tech industry as a whole, I know we've sort of repeated that a lot, but this is what the, I think the pandemic has really shown is a lot of the businesses that were maybe once in a retail type setting, they might look to shrink the retail footprint and go to a, a larger industrial footprint, primarily for online sales. And I think the mom and pop t-shirt shops, they will look at their cost of cons cus consumer acquisitions. It's cheaper to go online than it would be to have a retail storefront. So, you mean the tenant pool has grown dramatically, and I think the faces of these tenants have also changed. On top of that, I think when you look at from an owner-occupier standpoint, is usually in industrial, we have the largest percentage of owner-occupiers to investors than any other asset class. So now that you have end users competing for it, the numbers have become very, very attractive on the investment standpoint. So now investors are competing for it. You have a much larger tenant pool to draw from and a much smaller supply to pick from. The writing's on the wall. And if anyone's wondering where Adam is, he was so excited about that industrial talk, he's left to go find a mortgage broker to purchase some industrial assets. As a final thought on the industrial front, Corey, I'm wondering, I mean, I guess it all ties together here, but I'm just trying to see the impact of those mom and pop retail storefronts potentially converting to industrial. Like, does that, I still feel, even though you've given me a lot of confidence in retail, I still feel like that's the most challenging of the, of the three, Definitely. Uh, that we, the three asset classes we've talked about. And, so and don't kid yourself, you know, retail has been challenging and it will be challenging moving forward, but I don't think it's been as challenging or as bad as first expected. And like I said, I think this this pandemic is going to just you know expedite the change of face of the retail tenants, mm -hmm. and I think every market will have their own challenges, and that's where like hopefully some of these restaurant type you know, driven areas, the cities will allow larger patios, and now the stuff will kind of kick in, and that will really really change the culture and really change that business model moving forward, which would be great. So I think uh, I don't want to make it sound like retail's had no hiccups because there definitely has been and there definitely will be. It just I don't think they've been as bad as we first anticipated. Right, right. Okay, so we've talked retail. We've talked industrial. We've talked office space. Development land. Development land. This is uh, one near and dear to my heart, but what does it mean? Yeah, and so, I, don't, I don't know. Has COVID changed the, the face of this area? Well, this I think, cost? I well I, the, no more lands come in, into play. Like Vancouver hasn't grown and there's more land available for developers if that's what anyone was hoping for. That unfortunately <laughs> didn't happen. So I think, you know, like a lot of other asset classes there, there was definitely a stall in the marketplace. I think there's been a lot of consumer confidence brought back in. I think if you look at a lot of projects that maybe were stalled maybe 2018, 2019, 2020 on the residential side, with the success a lot of the markets of the condo industry has had, there's probably been a lot of product rush to market. I think a lot of condo developers are feeling much more confident in the marketplace. So now they're looking to acquire more land. And again, like I said, we haven't grown any more land during the pandemic. So it's right. still that competitive fever out there. So I think from a development standpoint, we we haven't really seen much of a pullback in that marketplace. Now, some areas and some sub-markets have been greater affected than other areas. But if you look at around the province, whether it be Victoria or even Kelowna for those matters, there's a lot of land that's gone to multiple offer situations due to lack of supply. And this is one, uh, this is not, uh, Commercial 101 is not where you talk about the economics of of land development, but that is something you're you're going to be focusing on here as well. What what a good development site looks like, you what those it. numbers look like, but it is interesting, right? Because if this in my well, I guess part of it has to do with COVID, but when you look at the last five eight years of development in Vancouver and, and land acquisition, it was like running like crazy 2016 2017. 2018, 2019, you basically stopped hearing about strata windups uh, yeah. and, and that type of thing. And in 2020 and into 2021 now, uh, we're back, yeah. right? So it seems like this is almost, I guess, arguably there's, you can make a case that it's related to COVID, but in some respects, the ebb and flow of, of this area of commercial real estate seems unrelated. Well, this is the biggest thing. And, and like on, on your last episode you guys had, you had Scott, Scott Brown on from Fifth Avenue Marketing, and he addressed a point that I think everyone in the industry has been yelling at for years. And I think when the NDP in, in 18, 19, they threw everything they could at the, the housing market. And they put a lot of uncertainty in that marketplace and probably, you know, I mean, people's equity in some positions probably, you know, probably dwindled a little bit. We, we haven't talked about foreign buyers for the past year. 
It hasn't come up. If we are dealing with a marketplace right now that probably has no immigration or maybe even a negative immigration, we have no international students here or very, very limited here, and the market is still growing out of control, that's a supply issue, first and foremost. And how you change that is you've got to make the red tape to get through these cities and make the rezoning processes a lot smoother, faster, and streamline them. And you also have to probably, to some degree, look at the costs it costs to get a development off the ground with the cities. A lot of people don't realize this, but depending on who you talk to, 10 to 15% of every dollar spent by an end consumer goes right into a city coffers. Now, I understand that's how cities have to grow. You know, there's a lot of things that come along with the development side of it. But looking at that aspect first and foremost, I think will help get more supply to the market. That's our biggest problem. And until we figure that out, it's, it's going to be the same thing over and over again. Now, fast forward a year and your borders are open. You have potentially some foreign investment coming back into the market. You have international students here. It, it's going to create a very chaotic place on the housing side for probably 2022, 2023, where the market's going to continue to go up. And I don't honestly know what more the local governments can throw at it because it's not a foreign buyer issue. It's a supply and demand issue. Well, the exciting thing that uh, that I'm looking forward to uh, on this show is well, one of the many things, but is thinking about developmental land, areas that are exciting, where developers are looking, where where the big opportunities lie. Because I mean, even if you're, you know, th- th- there's obvious overflow uh, if you're looking to purchase a condo, say, for an investment or looking for a retail space, say. I mean, th- where the people go, the money grows. Totally. And one thing this is spins off into the commercial world is in the multifamily asset class, where right now the vacancy rates haven't probably arguably really grown to where they thought they potentially would go, considering how much immigration, international students and everything like what we had in Vancouver. I'm not going to say they haven't gone up because they definitely have, but I think they haven't gone up nearly as much as everyone anticipated. So that's a very positive sign for when those borders reopen and then we do welcome the world back to Vancouver, that those vacancy rates from the multifamily side of it will probably remain very, very consistent moving forward. So I think that that helps a lot to that asset class. But unfortunately, the, the negative of all this we're pulling back on is housing prices will probably continue to grow and lease rates are probably going to continue to grow. And even when you look at it, with the current NDP government and the restrictions they have on the growth of the year over year, monthly rates for tenants and multifamily and condos, what happens is... You're so talking about the increase in, in rents, right? Increase the in rents, sorry, my to, apologies. To the increase, increase in rents yeah. tied to CPI. That, that demand is just going to swell. And what happens is when somebody moves out and that condo can turn over, it's going to go to market rates. And whether those market rates be $1,500, $2,000, $2,500, or $3,000, the landlord's going to set that price. If demand is there, they're going to get it. And that's going to now set the benchmark for the next one and the next one and the next one. That coupled over a, a two or three year period is dramatically going to put the, push the rental rates up and have a negative effect of what they're trying to accomplish. So one question I have for you, Corey. So we're talking uh, land development and, and multifamily. So when we're thinking about multifamily, these are usually institutional investors who own apartment blocks, right? Purpose-built rentals uh, where there's 50 units, 80 units, 120 units. What's always struck me about Vancouver is actually the, the acquisition cost as compared to the rent you actually achieve is is very high, right? Meaning the capitalization rate is very low. Can you talk about why people are still attracted to Vancouver when the when the cap rates are so low as compared to other markets? And And when I say people, I mean large uh, institutional investors from elsewhere. Yeah, and, and I think to, to shed a little bit more light on that is the marketplace for the multifamily assets are, are, are much more than just these big institutional buyers. As an example, we have a, a, one of our, our Kelowna office just listed a multifamily building with eight units for $2.4 million. So there is an achievable level for people to get into this marketplace, and we'll unpack that throughout this show. Um, but the trade-off from an investor standpoint is my vacancy rate is so low, I almost probably fluctuate with anywhere between 1% vacancy and 5% vacancy, depending on where the building is, mm-hmm. that that's a trade-off maybe for a higher cap rate with a much higher vacancy rate. And one thing that we always tell so clients... So the risk is low. The risk is low. One thing we always tell clients, you don't want to pay 
for your own risk. And by that, I mean, if I can get a 5% cap rate, but it's tagged with a 10% vacancy rate, by the time I flush out that vacancy rate throughout the year, I might have a far less cap rate than the 5% I thought I had. Versus when you look in Vancouver and a lot of the BC markets where you have very little vacancy rates, a lot of institutional and local investors will pay more for that knowing full well that they're probably going to be operating throughout the year or at least most of the year fully occupied or very, very close to. And if you look at Victoria two years ago, maybe three years ago, multifamily buildings were trading between five, five and a half, maybe even a six cap rate. Now you see them as low as three, three and a half because the, the world woke up and thought, wait a minute. I can get a much better return in Victoria with a very, very similar vacancy rate as Vancouver. Why am I going to go do that? And that's one thing too that when we, we talked about the Victoria show with you guys a couple of years ago, that was one thing that we were seeing. And I think what you're looking at is now not, not only are the local investors there that already knew that the whole time, but now you're getting a lot more people from the mainland that are looking at it because it can be challenging to earn money over here the same way you can earn in submarkets. Mm -hmm. On top of that, you have institutional buyers and funds and pension funds that have also seen this. So the landscape has greatly become much more competitive where that's pushing prices way, way up and cap rates down. Right. And so on almost any real estate podcast out there, you know, people talk about cash flow. They talk about higher cap rates. You've kind of talked on about this, you know, about vacancy obviously being something to consider and the, the low risk of the market here. But when you're talking to some of these folks that are buying apartment complexes, like is the play in their minds mortgage pay down primarily or playing appreciation just the way that other people in Vancouver are? Is it Does it mirror uh, the residential market? Well, I think a lot of it depends on the, the purchaser's uh, level of risk they're willing to take. And when you look at Vancouver, for, mar for an example, where we already have really, really high lease rates, let's just say in the retail sector, with probably a very, very low cap rate, in that scenario there, you're really, really banking on either lease rates continuing to chug upwards, which may or may not be reality over the next 10 years, but you're really uh, banking on them paying down your mortgage in that scenario. Yeah. But, and what about rents? Because I'm thinking a multifamily, we know that yeah. rents, you know, you can with turnover, you can raise your, your yeah. rents. But uh, the risk is even higher in my mind because of the Residential Tenancy Act yeah. limiting uh, the ability of those rents to rise. Well, if you look in like, if we take pockets of Yelltown, say next to the SkyTrain station, some of the retail rates there have achieved over $100 a foot now. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at that scenario, can they continue to, to grow at those type of rates where the, the tenant's now just working to pay the landlord at this point? Right. So in that circumstance, if I'm buying something like that with already, let's say, a $100 lease rate, at a 3% cap rate, which is tough to debt service before we start, there's not a lot of growth really I can probably look at over the next five years except for the tenant paying down my mortgage. Versus if you go into some other markets, let's we'll say like Victoria, which we're very bullish on, where I'm getting maybe a 4.5 or a 5 cap rate, but my tenant's paying $30 a foot. So there's, if we look at a historical chart, we can probably make an estimation those rates over there will probably grow because if you go downtown Victoria, there's lease rates as much as say 75 or $80 now a foot. But the cap rate will probably also come down because demand will go up. So now I might actually be able to make money three different ways. My tenant's still going to pay my mortgage down. My income on the property will go up over time. And that will probably, with demand, will push my cap rate down, which will push my price up. So that, those are tough dynamics to find. Right. And, and in terms of pricing, let's just spell this out, right? Because... It, in the residential world, we use comparables. Yeah. Okay. So you got 1506, you look at in the last year, 1706, uh, 1406 and 606 all sold. You basically, you know, it's not, it's not all that difficult to figure out what your unit's worth, yeah. but in the commercial world, you price things differently. Can little, you, can little you more just, complex. yeah, basically give it to me straight. So Corey's coffee shop won't get the same value from a purchaser as a tenant like such as Starbucks would. So there's credibility put on those tenants. And in one show, we have, we'll actually have a lawyer come on and we'll talk all about leasing and how that works. And we'll actually unpack how Starbucks has closed so many stores and how that may not be the best scenario from a landlord perspective entering into those leases. Right. So there's value in your tenant. There's also value in, say, development land play. So if it's a non But when you say there's value in your tenant, just so I understand, if I'm bringing a retail property to market, yeah. 
So that's part of the pricing is is which tenant you're your yeah. So we we look at you mean place. you mean you know and banks will put a lot more onus on those tenancies now than they did sort of pre COVID. Right. So the quality of tenant plays a factor. Okay. So that's one factor. The, the current lease rates, where if in commercial leasing, if I have a renewal option as a tenant coming forward, and I'm paying forty bucks a foot, and the market's servicing eighty dollars a foot, there's a high probability come renewal, my landlord's going to be looking to double the rents on me. So that also plays a factor into it. Like what are what are what we call the stabilized rents? What are market rents today? Is there upside in those rents that can be extracted in future value? If you're dealing in a non-strata situation, when's if you have a building that sits on the, f- the corner of 41st and Knight and it's a single story retail building on a 15 or 20,000 square foot lot, there's probably greater and higher and better use for that land than what currently sits there. So that also plays a factor into into pricing. Is is there development potential in this in this land? So that all couples together is sort of what goes into it, and then from there we extract what are comparables in the area with regards to cap rates and stuff like that. It's a lot harder to, to put a sort of a price per foot metrics on stuff unless it's sort of pre construction or arguably industrial. Because if I have two identical units that are both a thousand square feet, but tenant A pays ten bucks a foot and tenant B pays twenty bucks a foot and the cap rate's five, well, the tenant B that's paying 20 bucks a foot, that place is arguably worth double than what the, the place that tenant A tenants. So there's stuff like that that we have to take into effect. But, and but it's that's harder. not, yeah, so that that having that $20 a foot rent as opposed to the $10 a, a foot rent, that's on a kind of basic, very simple metric, that's that's kind of a key component, right? 100%. 5%, 100%. 5% cap rate, you take the rents, yeah, but that's not. It sounds like it's more complicated. Yeah, that, that that on the surface, that's how it's done. But then again, like so we had to look at upside and potential and stabilized values that go into those to those type of rents and stuff like that. Quality of the tenant. I yeah, obviously that's this is a show two or three shows I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, that's great. Last but not least, Corey, we've talked about office, we've talked about industrial, we've talked about retail, we've talked about developmental land and multifamily. This is generally speaking been a good news story. I, I I'm going to put one to you here where I don't think you can spin this in a positive way. The hotel industry, hotel and hospital. I, I, it can't get much worse. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, I think you I mean without a doubt that is the asset class has been hammered the most, uh, especially in Vancouver. You I mean the, I'll be honest with you, hotel sales and all that stuff is probably higher than my pay grade of what goes into them. Um, but that asset class has definitely has some challenges ahead of itself. I really think, like I think, like we talked earlier in the show, I think Vancouver is going to come roaring back with tourism and that will be the saving grace of it. But picture your business model where you have these huge, massive operations and then you have to literally go to almost probably zero revenue or 20% revenue for a year, maybe two years, figure that out, all of a sudden get a green light and have to completely start over. Right. These hotels are going to have to restaff. They're going to have to do everything. Major, major undertakings. So I think that that area definitely has some challenges moving forward. And one thing with the hotel industry is a lot of a lot of people from the think that Marriott owns the hotel. Well, Marriott might be the licensing brand or the management company commissioned to run the hotel on behalf of an ownership group. And that ownership group could be institutional, it could be a pension fund, it could be a large asset holder. Uh, could even be local people for all we know, right. right? So so there's a lot of things behind the scenes that go on in the hotel industry that we just think, oh, it's Marriott, they have 500 locations, they'll be totally fine. But locally, that's not unfortunately how it uh, sort of unpacks itself. So hotels definitely have a road ahead of them. But I think all things considered, I, I'm really hopeful we'll have a strong tourism season, maybe towards the end of this summer, maybe even just locally. But up into 2022, the cruise ships will come back. I mean, all of that stuff will hopefully play into our effect and we'll have a very strong outcome on it. But some challenges ahead for sure. Right. I I, I have a friend who works at a, a large hotel downtown and uh, he was one of eight or 12 people. It, it's incredible because there's hundreds of staff, right, pre-COVID. And and the staff was down to eight. To It was either eight or 12 people. He was luckily one of them, pretty senior, senior uh, person there. But what he said to me was they were – trying to weather the storm and plan uh, the kind of post-COVID world. And basically, he was saying, you know, they'd, they'd been in this market for, for decades, but they were approaching it as if they were opening a new location in a new city and they had no idea what it was going to look like. And that's uh, the way and, they, I think they have to tackle yeah. it. Like I was in Kelowna last week for work and the hotel that I was staying in, they had large groups of people that were going through training 101, you could see. 
Yeah. And I mean, that's a positive side because obviously they, they're feeling that the market's going the right direction, that they need to start staffing up. But I think that approach, where there's no business model out there. It says, hey, go run a major machine, make millions and millions of dollars, and then don't make anything and close down your business pretty much for a year, and then try to reopen and be successful. It's a hard thing to make work. And I think that approach is probably the most realistic approach they're going to have to take of looking at it as a brand new opening. Because you're going to have to staff everyone probably from the kitchen yeah. to the bellman to the janitorial staff to the front desk staff to everything. And, and definitely some challenges ahead for sure. All right. Well, maybe, and, and I'm, I'm sorry, I just have my host hat on here, Corey. I'm hey, saying no, may, I, maybe, maybe, maybe we'll wrap there. We've, we've talked about the five basic commercial uh, real estate asset classes. I, I've learned a lot. Just as a final question for you, you know, you're going to be manning this ship in the future, but what excited you about commercial real estate? I mean, I, I mean, you know, I, I, I said on our show not long ago, like I got, I just was unpacking stuff in my garage and, and found something from when my wife was eight years old and she actually said she wanted to be a real estate agent, which I didn't think anybody ever as a kid dreamt about being a real estate agent. And uh, she's went on and done something much more important with her life. But uh, but she did have that that goal when she was eight. I don't think anybody says they want to be a commercial real estate broker. So so can you just tell us, you know, the story here? How did, how did this, how did this come to, how did William Wright come about? Oh, geez. Um, so I, mean, I always had a passion for business and I always really like businessy things. And I think one thing in commercial real estate that's really exciting to see is you're working with clients, whether they be tenants moving into spaces, people buying spaces for their own business, investors, or even developers, where you're, you're, you're really helping grow a community and really take shape. And you can play a very, vi very vital part in the growth of that community. Um, you mean, when there's strip malls and that stuff that are being built, and we're sort of helping tenant them, bringing in grocer anchors and all of that stuff to really, really form and help position that, that asset there. It was a lot of fun in that. I mean, I think I was always drawn to that. I like helping people sort of start at A and get to B. And I think mm -hmm. that relates into exactly what William Wright Commercial became when we started almost nine years ago now, was we had a vision of what we wanted to do and open up, you know, smaller offices throughout the province. So we had boots on the ground per se with uh, being able to provide the best local advice, but still have like an international connection. And, you know, now we have five offices throughout the province. We have six coming online next year in Kamloops. We have our management office and, you know, bigger aspirations than that at some point. But I think just helping clients envision their their goals through commercial real estate, helping to achieve those is a really exciting thing. Right. And and I, I bet you never dreamt you'd be hosting the Vancouver Commercial Real Estate Podcast. Well, I can say I can cross this off my bucket list if that's what you're asking me. All right, folks, there you have it. I think that wraps up our first show. Matt, hey, that was good. I, I, Matt, I really the boss. enjoyed myself. You're the boss. How or, did I do? Do I, I do I get a second show? I or? was going to say, I think we're going to sign you for at least three more episodes. Ooh. <laughs> All right. So, so yeah, so really, I thought I was no, really exciting, really exciting stuff here. We're looking forward to it. We got, we got lots to unpack coming up. We've got a great list of, of upcoming guests that's going to talk to everything from sort of how do you finance commercial real estate all the way up to what is a commercial lease? How does that apply? How can people invest in commercial real estate? We'll tackle all of that stuff and then also everything out there that's happening in our, and, in our and industry. You, and you know what I would say, Corey, to conclude, and we've never really done this on our show, but I would say you'd probably encourage listeners to reach out with questions, right? Because 100%. 100 it we seems hear like to me, to, yeah, yeah, like this is, it's, it's one thing on the residential side, I feel like, you know, um, you can get a little overwhelmed with what's going yeah. on but i you know you you live and breathe this stuff and and there's some blind spots i think where some some people listening may be like hey break this down for me some real basic stuff that's that's actually not so basic it just seems that way because you uh well that's the purpose of this whole so show long. right yeah. is we want to we want to break that stuff down and i think one thing too like like we i know we keep saying demystify but but Commercial real estate is achievable for a lot of people out there, and we want to educate them and show them how to do that. So we would 100% encourage people to reach out to us with questions or show ideas or even comments, good or bad. Uh, we're happy to take all of that stuff, and if there's if there's continuous stuff out there that people want to know more about, then we're happy to educate them and break it down for them. Well, Corey, I'm super excited for the show, and I'm super excited for next week's episode. And maybe just give us a little tease, because I, I think you undoubtedly have somebody uh, more exciting next week than the Scalina Brothers. But uh, as I say that, uh, anyone who's still listening is undoubtedly wondering what happened to Adam, uh, who started the show uh, very prevalently and, and disappeared. And I can tell you exactly what happened. We started talking about 
restaurants in the retail space, and he got up and went for lunch. <laughs> well, that's what happens when you're the boss. You have you have those privileges. <laughs> that's exact. That's exactly it. Yeah, because when he left the room, and I thought, okay, we were done. I looked at my phone, and he said, "Don't even think about it." <laughs> So, so what's, what's up for next week? Uh, like I said, you got somebody really exciting joining you. Yep. We are, we're very fortunate. We have Alan Haig, who's the co-founder and managing partner of Impact Commercial. They're a boutique leading commercial mortgage company uh, based in North Vancouver. And we're going to unpack all about how you can invest in commercial real estate. But not only that too, if you're an owner occupier and you want to actually own your own space, right. a lot of people be very, very surprised how achievable that is. This is the one thing that is the most surprising thing about commercial real estate. You know, I think everybody thinks, you know, you have to have a monocle and wear a top hat to be in, in the space, and it's just not the case. You'd be very, very surprised how many people that we deal with that, that literally live in the city of Vancouver and could be your neighbor for all you know that own some very prominent real estate throughout the city. Fantastic. Well, how can people find out more about what you're doing over at William Wright Commercial and the Vancouver Commercial Real Estate Podcast, Corey? So people can reach out to us. You can reach me by email at Corey at WilliamWright.ca. And you're also welcome to visit WilliamWright.ca for any of our offices. If you're interested in buying commercial real estate, looking to lease commercial real estate, or even sell your commercial real estate, please reach out. We'll put you in touch with the best agent we have locally in the marketplace throughout any of our offices throughout the province, as well as they can also reach us at 604-428-5255 at our Vancouver office anytime. That's right. And the show notes will go on vancouverrealestatepodcast.com. Thanks so much, Corey. I'm acting like the host again. This is, I got to break this habit because I'm just the, uh, I'm not even sure well, what my I, role is here. This is, this is, you guys are the boss. You guys can take control of whatever you want. Have a good week. We'll talk to you next week. Guys. Thanks for listening, guys. Subscribe today. Oh, just that. <laughs>